Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the fourth Tuesday of the month, which means it's time for Eat Well, Move Well with our plant-based physical therapist, Eileen Kapsoftis, and today she is going to be continuing the discussion about Unknown Causes of Shoulder Pain, Part 2. Please welcome Eileen back to the show. Hello. I hear you just got back from a trip. Yes, yes. I was at the NHA conference. It was wonderful. Lots of great people. You know what I thought was really cool that I'd like to share one quick little fact? The staff in the hotel raved about how easy we all were to wait on and how nice everyone was and how patient everyone was when they had to refill the buffet table and that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, because, you know, when you're eating all the standard American diet, you're kind of grumpy. <laughs> yeah. And like, and food becomes an emergency. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, you, you got to wait another 10 minutes. Oh my gosh. What do you, you know? Yeah. So I just think that's why it's because of what we're eating. Right. <laughs> that, that's, that is fascinating. Yes. So, all right. So I'm doing part two this month because I talked last month and, you know, the shoulder is a very, it, it's called the shoulder complex for a reason. And, um, you know, having limited time as far as the show is, a, is an hour with questions and stuff. I, you know, I can't go on for 18 hours about the shoulder, but I am hosting an event that starts tomorrow where I will be spending an hour and a half for three days in a row on more detail about the shoulder and how to train it and all. And it's free. So hopefully everybody will want to join me. But um, that said, I want to finish up from where I was last week. So I do have some slides and I think I should be able to share my screen, correct? Mm -hmm. I have always been able to do it in the past. So let's see if uh, I can still figure that out. There we go. Is everybody seeing my slides? Yes, perfect. All right, perfect. So, um, you know, I I'm calling this unknown facts about shoulder pain, AJ, because so many people focus on the shoulder. You know, I kind of joke and say, you can't take your shoulder off and put it on a shelf when you go to bed. It's connected to everything else. And so a lot of the times when people go to train and resolve shoulder pain, even if they go to a, an expert, you know, a physical therapist or, or um, <clears throat> anyone else who's an expert in, in musculoskeletal conditions, if it's not their shoulder, they're chasing their tail, right? So I wanted to make sure everybody understands why it's called the shoulder complex isn't just because it's a complex joint. So that said, um, I always like to start with this, uh, understanding authentic human movement. And I should probably put that authentic in red because a lot of the movements that we do are not authentic. They're not how the body is trained to move and to work and to perform. And so we do a lot of things repetitively that cause harm. And so sometimes I believe a lot of people have shoulder issues simply because of how they're training their shoulder. They're isolating it. The other uh, rest of the body parts aren't supporting and encouraging healthy shoulder movement. And so they're literally <clears throat> creating irritation, potential inflammation and all that kind of stuff. Um, obviously diet is huge. You know, diet can create con chronic inflammation in the body. People are shocked when they change their diet, just how much better they feel and how much less joint pain they have. So that's a biggie. But I'm talking here specifically about physical movement. So understanding authentic human movement leads to better training choices with improved results because we do better training and we see better results from that training. And then, of course, this is for informational purposes only. This is education. I'm not diagnosing anyone. I'm not treating anyone. Please make sure that if you go to do any of the movements that I demonstrate or talk about, that it's okay for you to do so. You know, get, get advice from your healthcare professional, especially if you've got issues. You might have been told not to do something. I'm not telling you to ignore that advice, okay? All right. Now, <clears throat> shoulder pain, right? This is what the shoulder looks like with all the skin and muscle and nerves and everything on it. And this is what the shoulder looks like without all that stuff on it. And these are ligaments here. Uh, a ligament is how bone connects to bone. It's very strong, it's very protective. It will limit how, uh, it will limit the motions that a joint has available to it unless it gets injured, right? A lot of people know what a sprained ankle is and that's what happens, the ligament gets injured and the joint goes in a motion that's beyond its um, 
potential or its ability to do so without injury. And so uh, that's what happens. And, um, you know, our shoulders are, as I said, the most mobile joint in the body. They perform so many physical functional tasks and activities in life that we enjoy doing, like playing tennis or, or golf or just hugging our grandchildren. I mean, you know, we need shoulder function, right? Or reaching up to scratch your back or, you know, wash your hair. We need shoulders to be functioning properly. So I'm just going to briefly mention, you know, common shoulder diagnoses. And I'm going to talk about common shoulder treatments. And then I'm going to talk about the kind of disconnect between that and real shoulder function. So hopefully you're going to learn some things today that you're going to go, huh? Your brain might go tilt a little bit. Or those of you who really have great uh, critical thinking skills, you're going to go, yeah, that makes sense. That's logical, right? So rotator cuff injury, impingement syndrome, bursitis, tendonitis, osteoarthritis, shoulder pain, all of these things. Um, are things that are diagnosed. And yes, I've had patients come in with a diagnosis of shoulder pain. That was it. No actual musculoskeletal uh, definition was in there, just the word pain. So this is where, you know, you might be surprised to learn that when the shoulder is imaged, right? X-rays, MRIs, all that kind of stuff. The extent of tissue damage observed on clinical imaging, which means what they see upon the image, does not correlate with the shoulder pain intensity. Thus the relevance, and this is their quote, not mine, because I wouldn't say thus the relevance, um, thus the relevance of diagnosing structural pathology in people with shoulder pain has been challenged by many in research and clinical practice. And this is starting to become much more prevalent, much more well known in the medical community, right? We can't just validate someone's pain because of an image and send them off for treatment because it could be completely missing the mark. And then um, in the general population, 20 to 40% of the general population show asymptomatic rotator cuff tears, asymptomatic. When you see the word A and the letter A in front of symptomatic, it means without symptoms, no symptoms no pain, no complaints. So 20 to 40% of the general population has rotator cuff tears without any symptoms. So what does that mean and why does it matter? Well, it suggests, as you can read here, structural pathology may not fully explain the perception of shoulder pain and the potential for these diagnostic labels to mislead treatment. So Say someone has shoulder pain, they image it. Oh, they've got a rotator cuff tear. Well, they might've had that rotator cuff tear for 10 years with no symptoms. Or what caused the rotator cuff tear might be what's causing the pain. It doesn't mean the tear is the cause of the pain. Hopefully that's making sense to some of you. Now, now please, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Obviously, if somebody has an, an acute injury, they have a, a, a full a full rupture, a full tear, then, you know, yeah, it could very well be that. And we, we might want to get in there and repair that shoulder. But, excuse me, it may not be the case. All right, let's look for some common treatments for shoulder pain. Injections, medications, right, anti-inflammatories. Um, corticosteroid injections, and then of course, full-blown surgeries and conventional PT. I say conventional because they see you as a shoulder that walks through the door. They, unfortunately, they don't know any better. This is not disrespect meant to anyone, but they think that, you know, legally their hands are tied or medically their hands are tied. They can't look at any other body part, but your shoulder and that kind of thing, which is inaccurate. And I don't want to get off on a tangent, but, um, but, you know, they're going to do hot packs and ultrasound and, and ice packs and specific stretching and maybe some passive range of motion and some mobilizations and joint work and that kind of thing. But again, what if it's not your shoulder? What that's causing the problem and is the reason for the shoulder pain, right? So 
the most important question to ask when you're advised to do any of these things, start a medication or have a, an injection or have a test taken, especially if it's an invasive type test or undergo a procedure specifically is how effective is it at fixing my problem and what are the risks? Because there's a lot of stuff that's done out there where, you know, if you don't ask these questions, you won't know the answers. And sometimes the answers may surprise you. Just because something is recommended doesn't mean it's, oh, yeah, this will fix you. You'll be fine. And, you know, you, no worries. No. OK, what are my risks? What, what, what bad stuff can happen to my body if I do what you're recommending I do? Even if it's only like a 10 percent risk. Well, that's 10 out of 100. What if you're one of that 10? Right. So it's and so you need to know the risks. Then you're making an informed decision. Nobody's telling you what decision to make, but you want to be informed when you make it, right? Isn't that important to know? All right, and then here's some statistics. So if all the diagnosing and all the common treatments are actually working and are effective, then why is shoulder pain the third most common musculoskeletal complaint presenting to physiotherapy? Well, that doesn't say, well, yeah, well, then they should fix them, right? But this next statement might surprise you. About half of new episodes of shoulder pain resolve in eight to 12 weeks. So that means half of them don't, right? And about 40% of the cases persist for longer than a year with rates of recurrence, which means it keeps coming back, and chronicity, which means it doesn't go away, rated as moderate to high. So if all the diagnosing is working and all the treating is working, why is it almost half of people who have shoulder problems, they don't ever get rid of them? Maybe it's because it's not the shoulder that's causing the problem. So hopefully a light bulb, <clears throat> excuse me, is going off in your head right now, right? So, and then, you know, 40 50 to 50% of those who experience shoulder pain report a recurrence within one to five years. So that's how often the recurrences are happening. And then about 13% were still attending medical services during the third year of follow-up. That's scary. Who wants problems in their shoulder for years? And, and you know, if the medical services were alleviating the pain and restoring their function and they could do their daily tasks of life without any, any problems, then I guess they might not mind. But I'm thinking that's not what's happening here, right? Their function is pretty impaired, more than likely, at this point. So, and then many with shoulder pain do not experience a complete resolution of symptoms. So there's lots of data out there that shows this. So, you know, they might get a little bit better. They might be able to lift their arm up, you know, mostly overhead. They can't go all the way, right? They might be able to lift it up a little bit. Um, but God forbid they reach behind them when they're in the car to get something off the back seat. It's going to scream at them or they can't reach into their back pocket to get something out of their back pocket. Or a lot of women, when they put their bra on, they, they, they hook it behind and they say they can't even hook their bra. So, you know, or wash your hair. I know a lot of people who say, yeah, I have to, I have to use one hand to wash my hair in the shower because the other arm won't do that motion. Or reach across to wash the other armpit. I mean, all of these functional things, you know, that we take for granted right? Until we can't do them. So I want to talk with you about mostly unknown causes of shoulder pain for a few minutes here. And then I'm going to go downstairs to my gym and I'm going to show you kind of part two of this, where the part one, I'll, I'll briefly review. I won't go into the whole detail of them, but I'll briefly review what I mentioned in part one, and then we'll, we'll move to part two today for workout or for exercises and movements. But the mostly unknown causes of shoulder pain is chronic inflammation. And as I said, yeah, what you put in your mouth, if you're consuming the standard American diet, you are promoting chronic inflammation. You have got a brick on the gas pedal that has just got your inflammatory cytokines in a tizzy, right? And then impaired ankle function. You're like, what on earth does that have to do with the shoulder? I will explain. Impaired hip and pelvis function. Yeah. Impaired trunk motion. What? And then I want you to remember this term, even though it's not Halloween, peltruncula. I'm going to explain this briefly in a moment. 
Sounds like young Chocula. Doesn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But I love the term and and, and I'm I'm excited to share it with everybody. So, So the primary cause of joint damage, this is the Stanford University School of Medicine did a study. And I I know I've presented this a lot, you know, almost every time that I've been a guest here on Chef AJ's show. But it's so important because I never know who's watching me for the first time and may not be aware of this. But everybody thinks that osteoarthritis and joint damage is all, you know, it's wear and tear. It's old age. It's gravity. It's, oh, I've been on my feet all my life. That's why my knee is shot. It's not true. The Stanford University School of Medicine did a study and they determined that the primary cause of joint damage is not compression. It's not wear and tear. It's not old age. It's chronic inflammation. And food is a primary cause of chronic inflammation. Huge. Now, yes, you could have it from an accident or an injury and the inflammation might struggle to resolve because the injury struggles to resolve. But healing and repair mechanisms are also radically influenced by the food you put in your mouth as well, right? So, and then osteoarthritis, it's the leading cause of chronic disability in the U.S. And if it's because of chronic inflammation and it's because of what people are eating, guess what? This doesn't have to be the leading cause of chronic disability, but people have to know this stuff, right? You can't make an informed decision if you're not informed. So let's move on with the impaired ankle function. So dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion is a very important movement. And as you can see, it's when your heel stays down on the floor and you lift your toes up off the floor. That is dorsiflexion of the ankle. And the normal range is about 20 degrees. And you might be saying, what on earth does that have to do with my shoulders? Well, if you watched my other guest spot when I talked about plantar fasciitis, or you've gone to my own YouTube channel and you've watched when I did my little demonstration with my favorite model here of the foot, I explain the function of the ankle. It has two very important tasks. And if it's not doing that, it influences everything from the ground up so that your leg bones are not responding the way they're supposed to or performing the way they're supposed to, which doesn't switch on the muscles the way that it's supposed to which doesn't cause pelvis function the way it's supposed to, which impacts trunk function, which impacts shoulder function. So it can all be, did you sprain your ankle 20 years ago and it never healed properly and you completely don't, are clueless that you're lacking dorsiflexion with eversion or with inversion, you know, some specifics, biomechanics of the ankle, and it could very well be impacting your shoulder. Especially if you are throwing, if you're a football quarterback or a baseball pitcher or, you know, I I can't tell you how many sports people I have cured their shoulder pain by restoring ankle function and never touched their shoulder. So it is critical that that joint is functioning properly for the health of your entire body. I mean, even if you happen to be watching this and you don't have shoulder pain, if you've got back pain or hip pain or knee pain or neck pain. If your ankles aren't performing right, that could very well be one of the missing links that you were clueless about, and it's important that you address it, right? And then the eversion, inversion, that heel is supposed to move out and in, responding to gait and, and movement of the body. And again, that is what causes the subtalar joint above it to either rotate down and in or rotate up and out which is what triggers everything from your shin bone up to do what it's supposed to do. And so if it's not, I mean, you could be walking and all those mechanics are skewed or impaired and your shoulder could be taking the brunt because of that, right? And so, you know, like I said, that rotation, your shin bone, your tibia, that's your shin bone. This has to rotate in. Um, out. This is external rotation. It has to rotate in. This is internal rotation. And it has to do with what that heel bone is doing, right? So this is a right foot. And so this heel is inverting and that causes internal or sorry, external rotation and then vice versa. And so uh, I'm not sure if this is, this has gotten a little bit backwards somehow because it should be the opposite. Somebody didn't create this slide properly, but not to get you confused and you're not all here to be biomechanics experts anyway. 
Just know that as the heel inverts and everts, it, it, oh, I'm sorry, it is correct. When the heel everts, it does rotate internally. For some reason, I was looking at the slide and it, it just was looking backwards to me. I'm um, getting a little dyslexic, I guess. So we want that heel to, to go out. This rotates in. It causes the subtalar joint to drop down and in. Uh, it, it's just, it does, it's it's like Insu Nice. It does it all, right? And and it, it it has to. And then because of what this causes from the ground up, it causes a, a response in your trunk, which then from the top down causes this to happen. And then if this doesn't happen, it won't trigger it to do this again in the very next step. So it's all connected. Everything's connected to everything else. Healthy foot and ankle function is primary for entire body proper authentic function. Absolutely. I look at the foot and ankle of pretty much everyone I work with, especially athletes. Okay, impaired hip and pelvis function. Because of that chain reaction from the ankle up, right? But what if there's something going on in your hip? What if one of your hips doesn't rotate? or adduct, which means leg moves away from midline and opens the hip up wider, or adduct, which one leg crosses over the other. What if you're limited in any one of the motions that the hip is supposed to do? The hip is the second most mobile joint in the body. It, um, you know, the shoulder being the most mobile. So what if something's going on there? Well, if something stops that reaction that from the ground up, and it stops here at the hip, it's not going to influence the trunk motion properly, which is going to impact shoulder function because it's got to get to the shoulder, right? It's got to get to that. And we're going to talk about peltruncula in just a moment. So, so how are your hips? Are they working really well or not so much? So, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh yeah, I've had that hip problem for years. I can't tell you how many patients have come into the you know, to see me and they say, oh yeah, I'm not here for my back. You know, I'm here for my shoulder. Well, you've had back problems for eight years now. Guess what? That's probably why your shoulder's not happy. We may need to address the back in order to fix the shoulder, right? Or we may need to see what's causing the back problem because it's causing the shoulder problem too. Let's look for the cause. Let's not beat up the victim of whatever else is not functioning properly and ignore the culprit, right? That's why the title of my book is Pain Culprits, because there are these parts of the body that are silent saboteurs, and we're not even aware of it, and we're chasing our tail trying to fix pain or problems someplace else, right? The same thing with how we train our bodies. We're trying to isolate and focus, you know, well, you can focus on a body part, but if you try to isolate a muscle, like just do the, the lateral deltoid, well, you're, you're setting yourself up for creating some serious issues going on. So we need to understand how everything's connected and how to properly train and how to properly rehabilitate and properly restore authentic human function. And that's the number one reason why I'm here. When, when AJ you know, offered me the chance to come here every month, I want to erase pain from the world. It's my passion, my deep passion. And most of the time people are in pain because of a lack of information, right? Sometimes it's a lack of motivation. Um, you know, but for the most part, a lot of people are trying really, really hard to fix something, but they're not doing the right things because they don't know what they are. So, okay. So how are your hips? Can you squat? If you can't squat, your hips are not working properly. All right. Now you might have knee pain when you squat and you might think, well, it's my knees. Well, guess what? Your knee is a simple hinge joint choked, stuck between the hip and the ankle and no place to go. So it's probably your hips that aren't working right or your ankles that aren't working right. And that's why your knee's not happy when you squat, right? Now, yes, you could have some serious structural damage going on in the knee. I'm not discounting that. But for the most part, you know, can you squat? If you can't, you know, the same thing that's causing that inability could be causing your shoulder pain. I just want to really open your mind here and get you to think globally, to, to, to pull back that lens from the shoulder and look at the entire body because your shoulder is not a part that you take off and put on a shelf. 
Everything's connected to everything else. Okay. All right. Impaired trunk motion. When I found this picture, I thought, ooh, a lot of you are going to be like, oh my goodness, does that look like that hurts? Obviously, little ones have, you know, they have a lot of um, easy ligamentous, I don't want to say laxity. It's just they're, they're more mobile. They're more flexible for the most part. I'm sure you, because of all of our technology today, you might find a lot of little kids who couldn't do this now. But this is a nice trunk ability to extend. Um, and look at how high up her arms are fully flexed, which means her upper thoracic spine is also fully extended right? So it's important for you to understand that your trunk has to be fully mobile in all three planes of function so that your shoulders are fully mobile. If your trunk is not fully mobile, your shoulders will not be fully mobile. They cannot be. And that's because, and I don't mean you have to be able to bend backwards like this, but if you're limited in any one of the, the six motions, which is bending forward, bending backward, side bending right, side bending left, rotating right, rotating left. If you're limited in any of those motions, it's gonna impact shoulder function, absolutely. You might not even have shoulder symptoms at the time, or at the moment, you may have symptoms elsewhere, like your neck or your low back, because your trunk is you know, in between those two structures and it's not doing its job, right? So um, hopefully this is, this is really starting to, to set some bells off for everybody. So how's your thoracic spine? Is it healthy? Does it move well? Is it mobile or are there limitations? So do you want just relief of symptoms or resolution of the cause? What is your goal? Do you wanna just get an injection? Well, guess what? If there's a problem with the biomechanics of the shoulder because the thoracic spine's not working properly or the ankle's impaired or the hip's not functioning well and you inject a corticosteroid in there, which is an anti, it's meant to be an anti-inflammatory agent and it, and it medically manipulates the inflammation and you no longer feel the pain or it's much less pain and you start using that shoulder more you're potentially doing more damage because you're not getting the message of the pain, but the biomechanics are still off, right? Same thing with medically manipulating pain, taking anti-inflammatories and analgesics and, and full out pain meds and, and narcotics, medicating pain and then using the body part, not a good idea, right? I used to tell my patients, don't take medication before you come here. Now, I know there are some PTs who say, oh, take your medication before you come because you know it's going to hurt. And I, I don't No, not when you're rehabbing properly. That is the opposite of what should be happening in the clinic, but I don't want to digress. All right. So I am hosting a train away shoulder pain three day challenge. It starts tomorrow. This is the link for it. It is free. It's three days, 90 minutes a day. It is recorded if you can't be there live, but you need to register so that you have access to all the content. I'm even rewarding those who do their homework. I love to reward people who are willing to work hard. Um, but, uh, oh, I have to talk about peltruncula, right? So peltruncula stands for pelvis, trunk, and scapula. Your pelvis, which is your hips, right? And your, and your, your sacral area there and your trunk and your scapula all feed each other. All the muscles that connect to all those structures and interconnect between each other, feed each other. Of course, so does the ankle. So I don't know if we could get, can we get ankle peltruncula in there somehow? Um, maybe there's a way to, to finagle that word and get that in there. But it's, it's really important that you understand just how connected everything is, right? So, um, okay, so I'm going to go downstairs. I want to demonstrate some movements and, uh, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little Q&A and answer some questions. All right. Thank you. I will see you all down there. All right. Let me tell you, you guys can register for that for free. I put the link in the chat. I'll also put it in the show notes.
and may as well tell you now let's see who is on the show tomorrow it is dr chala and dr chala and they'll be talking about substance use addictions and behavior change and now back to eileen in the studio as soon as she comes back there she is i am here can you hear me yep all right so um i got sorry i just got distracted my husband was two hours late coming home from work and he never called and i've been panic stricken and he just walked in the door so i had to yell at him for a minute <laughs> Of course, that's important. Of course. I mean, I had my, I texted my son to pray. I didn't know what was going on with him. Okay. So, um, so everything's connected to everything else, right? It's so important for you to understand that. So in part one of this, I did a <clears throat> training on making sure ankles were working right. Now, do understand that, you know, when I teach movements in here, these are kind of basics. These are introductory. I don't know what's going on in your world. I don't know what's hurting you. I don't know what your issues are. I haven't assessed you, right? So I just want to be cautionary here that, you know, it, it may not be a movement that's going to benefit you, for one thing. Uh, it may not be the movement you need to be doing. There may be other movements I'm not teaching that would benefit you. So it I, I doesn't mean that this doesn't work and that that won't help you to train other parts of your body. I just want to clarify that. I don't want you to feel like, you know, hopeless. Oh my gosh, even that didn't help me, right? Because there's only so much I can teach here in one session. And so hopefully you'll come to the challenge and I can answer Q&A. So that said, we did foot and ankle in part one. We did hips in part one and we did trunk in part one. And I, I demonstrated some movements and kind of clarified how they all sort of impact the shoulder. So now what I'd like to do in part two is some actual shoulder exercises, but I'm going to show you how to exercise your shoulder in a way that makes sure the rest of your body is playing nice with your shoulder as a team. Okay. You know, that whole pel truncula. We want everything to be working with the shoulder. So what that means is you don't necessarily want to be isolating, say, your anterior deltoid, which is, you know, your deltoid is the, the big shoulder muscle that surrounds the top of the humerus. And so you've got anterior, which is the front, lateral, which is the side, and posterior is the back. There's three heads to the deltoid. And so if you wanted to isolate the anterior deltoid, you would stand like this and you would you would lift a weight and you would just go forward like that and you would make sure that's all you were doing. You wouldn't let any other body part help. And now I have to explain something. When it comes to um, physics, okay? Physics is, we can't get away from physics. Physics is what physics is, like gravity. You know, you can say, oh, I don't agree with gravity, but if you step out a second story window, gravity's going to win, okay? So physics has to do with um, motion. Uh, well, there's a lot of things about physics, but specifically talking about motion, even human motion, a body in motion tends to stay in motion, right? So, and then a body at rest tends to stay at rest. So the thing about inertia, I mean, if you go to push something heavy, to get it started is really hard, but once you get it started, it's not so bad, right? Depending on how heavy it is and, and your own structure, your own strength. But, but there's another physics thing that I want you to think about, and it's for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So what that means is when I go to get out of a chair, okay, I want to explain this to you because it's going to make so much, much better sense to you when it comes to your shoulder. So when I go to get out of this chair, okay, I'm not just floating up off the chair. I mean, my backside isn't just lifting up off the chair. I'm pushing through my feet into the floor, right? I'm going to lean forward. I'm going to push through my feet with an equal and opposite reaction of the strength that's required for my body weight to lift up off the chair. So when you go to do exercises, when you go to lift weights, when you go to do weight exercises, there's an equal and opposite reaction happening somewhere, either between your body and the environment or in your body, okay? And so it's important for you to know that because why are we trying to 
eliminate or restrict that equal and opposite reaction? Why are we trying to take it away from where it's supposed to happen and cause it to happen someplace else that just leads to irritation, inflammation, injury, pain? It's, it's, I, I've, I've never really understood it. It, it it's, it's, goes against physics. So let me explain what that means and why it matters when it comes to the shoulder, all right? So if I go to lift a weight, all right? And I wanna do that one where I'm just gonna use my anterior delt. I'm not gonna let anything else do anything. I'm just gonna lift that up. Well, in order to lift that up, I've got body parts that are pushing down into the floor, creating an equal and opposite reaction so that I can lift that up and I can hold that there. There's an equal and opposite pressure happening between my body and the floor. But because I didn't allow my body to move or be part of this motion, I can feel this stress over time happening in my low back. Right, my low back says, well, wait a minute, what are you doing? I, I'm, I'm trying to hold that weight up there. Why isn't the rest of the body helping? What's going on with the pushing into the floor thing? Okay, so ideally what would be a better thing would be to do just a tiny little bend in the knee. And so that now I'm ready to push through the floor as I come up. So now, right, if you've got shoulder issues, you're starting to get your body to play as a team with your shoulders. So let me show you a couple of exercises. A lot of people love to do overhead presses for the shoulders, right? So let me show you, let's see, we'll do some, some light weights here. These are, these are just five pounds. Um, if, you're, if you've got shoulder issues, I recommend you do these without weight, okay? But the goal is, if I want to do shoulder press, right, typically we either do this seated or we do it standing and we wouldn't let anything else help. We're just going to push that up there and we're going to come back down and we're not going to, we're going to isolate those shoulders. We're going to get those delts just ripped, right? We don't want anything else. And I hope when I go overhead, I'm not making my microphone be muffled. Sometimes that happens. So the goal is let's get the body involved. All right. So, oh, and also if you're using a weight that makes your body stiffen in order to lift it, well, unless you're trying to win an award or, um, you know, you're in a competition, there's no reason to do that. And you're, you're literally lifting weights that are too heavy for you and you shouldn't be doing it and you're risking injury, okay? If it forces you to, oh, I'm really stiffen to lift, pick that up, not necessarily a good idea repetitively over time. Okay, so... Say I just want to do a simple shoulder press, but I want peltruncula working. I want my pelvis, I want my trunk, and my scapula all playing nice with each other. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to get my pelvis under my shoulder girdle on that side that lifts up, and then I'm going to do the same thing here. See? I'm getting my pelvis beneath it. So my shoulder girdle has a really nice base of support that that support is there. And because of the movement, the mass and momentum happening, my shoulder's a lot happier about this because it says, yay, I got my team back, right? If I was gonna lift something up overhead at home on a shelf, I would be literally pushing up onto my tiptoes using my whole body to lift that up over the shelf. I wouldn't be saying, oh, I can only use my lateral delt. I better make sure I don't use any other muscle. I better, no. In real life, we don't do any of that. So let's stop doing that in exercise. You can focus on the shoulder, you can focus on the delts, but you don't wanna leave the shoulder out to dry and hanging out to dry, I should say, and not allow any other body part to help. So I'm gonna show you a few overhead motions, right? So this is sideways, you can go straight up. Now you can tell it feels very different and your shoulder may feel a lot happier with this, right? Now, if you wanna make it just a little bit more intense, you can come over your head, right? So that when I, I still got my hip going out there and I'll show you from behind, I still got my hip going out there, but now I'm going overhead and I'm getting a lot more trunk 
and hip and pelvis, right? Because of that side bend. And with the weight attached, especially, you get a lot more mass and momentum, okay? So again, you're going, I'm still got my pelvis. My pelvis is under that shoulder girdle as I go to the side. And then I'm just gonna switch sides. So I'm going up toward the ceiling, but then across my head. And that's really gonna get that shoulder mobilized and healthy and stronger. Now, we also wanna do a motion where we are going um, forward, okay? And so, because there's three planes of motion, those of you who heard me talk, there's always more than one plane of motion. That's the frontal plane when you're going on the sides like that. But if you wanna do the sagittal plane, we're gonna do a little bit of a, kind of like a little mini squat, just a little squat down so that we can push through the floor, use gravity and ground reaction force, right? And mass and momentum to, so that our shoulder and the team are all working together, right? So if I do that little tiny squat and then I push up and I go up toward the ceiling and you can do that. I mean, you can do this all day long. Obviously, if you've got a heavier weight, you're gonna do the, the, the appropriate number of repetitions, but this is a beautiful way to work shoulders really healthy. And if you wanna make it a little harder, you can lean back and go behind your head. And as I do that, that's going to load the front of my body more and the front of my shoulder more. So you will get a well-rounded shoulder workout. And then there's two more motions. We do want rotation. You're kind of winding up like you're getting ready to, to you know, do a shot put or something. I don't know if any of you have ever been involved in any of those types of sports. But if I kind of wind up, I'm doing that little squat, and then I push through my feet, and I come down and I push through my feet. So I'm using gravity, ground reaction force, mass and momentum, and I am getting that hand up there, right? Kind of like you're doing a little uppercut to a giant, that's usually how I describe it. But you wanna make sure it's nice and smooth. The whole team is working. Now your shoulder is saying, woohoo, I'm not being forced to do this by myself anymore. Thank you, God, right? And then I'm going to go ahead and go behind me because when I go behind me, that's working more the front of the shoulder. And now it's kind of like that giant sort of snuck up behind me. But again, you can see I'm doing that little squat, that little turning back there like that. So you can... You can do heavier weights. You can do whatever reps are appropriate for you. What are your goals? If your goals are to be toned and, you know, fit, then you're going to use a weight where, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 reps, right? Um, if, you're, if your goal is to do hypertrophy and really build muscle, then you would be using heavier weights. But again, you're not going to use weights that are so heavy that you're, you're, your whole body's getting really stiff. You're not strong enough for that weight yet. You need to make sure you're strong enough, right? And um, you could use TheraBand, but for that one, it'd be a little challenging. Maybe if you put it on your foot, I usually just use weights for that. So there are other ways you could kind of modify that. Now, you know, as I said, that's just one example or demonstration of how to do all three planes of motion in a shoulder press, overhead shoulder press, using weights, but don't use weights if you're brand new at this. If you've got issues, <clears throat> if one shoulder doesn't like maybe two of those movements, but it's okay with the other four, make sure it's truly okay. When you do something repetitively, if there's pain, it's not helping you. Your brain is trying to figure out a way to stop the pain. And so it's literally training the wrong muscles, the wrong pathways, the wrong way. And you're training in dysfunction. You're training how to work around the pain. So you don't want it to be painful. And uh, you want to make sure that it's comfortable and, and just keep going. It's, there, there's lots you can learn. 
But anything you're doing, if you're doing it in a gym, um, if you're doing it at home, exercise, you know, watching YouTube videos, whatever, just be sure that you're not beating up the victim, right? And you're, you're actually addressing the culprits. That's, that's key for pain anywhere in the body. All right. Okay. I'm ready to answer any questions, AJ, if there are any. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, now, some questions have been sent in in advance. So they're not necessarily on the shoulder. I don't know if you will take those or not. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so let, let's get to the ones that were sent in in advance too. Um, um, here we go. They are good ones. And of course, I'll look in the chat to see if there's any shoulder related ones. Okay, so the first one is from Julie and she wants, oh, this is so long. I can't. <laughs> I'm going to skip that one and try to get a shorter one first. Guys, you've, you've got to book a consult when you write pages and pages and pages. <laughs> just, I mean, because they're just, they're just a detail oriented person, AJ. I know, but I mean, it, but I just, you know, I can't read their whole middle of that story because it's not fair and there's not time. But here's a nice short one from Marg. <clears throat> it's what stretches or movements should you do daily before or getting out of bed? every morning before getting out of bed or when getting out of bed every morning. She's 70 in good health with no aches, but wants to stay flexible. Okay. So that's a really good question. Um, it kind of depends. And I'm not trying to get out of answering the question accurately. It really depends on the person. I, I don't really, I'm, I'm of the tenant where there's no like, okay, do these three exercises for life and you'll never have a problem kind of thing. I mean, I've seen a lot of YouTube channels who, who people will propose that. And I'm not saying they're necessarily wrong. I just find that every single person is unique as a fingerprint, right? I mean, you can joke and say we're all snowflakes, right? Because we're all different. We're all unique. And, and so What's really good for one person to do every single morning may be the exact wrong thing for somebody else to do every single morning. So what, what's really important is to get the body moving in all three planes of motion and loading the muscles eccentrically. If you remember my, my monkey here, right? And I talk about how your muscles are controlling motion once it's initiated and they get longer and longer and longer and longer and longer and longer, and then they release once you've done that movement, then that's what we want to do when you get up out of bed. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, I, I very rarely recommend any exercises to be done lying down or sitting. It, it, if the person has to, that's one thing. But if you're able to be on your feet and you're somebody who's walking, then exercise on your feet because that's how you live your life. Right. And so and that's how you want to reverse anything. If you're sitting for eight, 10, 12 hours a day as well, you want to get up off the back backside. So <clears throat> anything that does three plane motion. So I'll just show everybody a really quick, easy square stance, which um, is where your feet are side by side, pointed forward. You can alter your foot position depending on what you need. You can go wider, narrower, one foot forward, toe out, toe in, whatever makes your knees happy, whatever makes your hips happy or your back. But just start like this and you can do a little down and forward, depending on how low you can go comfortably. I mean, if you can squat low, that's even better, but if, because that's going to wake everything up on your backside, it's going to get max awake. And then you bend back and get a nice extension, really open up the front of the body because that hip gets all closed up most of the time when we're sitting and get those arms way up there because it's going to open up the top of the T-spine. So that's a really good for sagittal plane. And then frontal plane is just side to side. You're going to load the sides of the body. And depending on how far down you go and how slow you go, that's going to really load the sides of the body. And then rotation, you would have your arm out in front and you want to rotate as far as you can. Now you'll notice after a couple of reps, you can go further, right? You just inchworm your way further and further and further. And you can see I'm even going further, even just the second rep. So you do that, you've just woke up your body in three planes of motion, like from nose to toes. And that's, I think, a really good way to start the day. But for some people that might not be advised depending on what's going on in their world. Great, thank you. And in the chat, Anne who's watching live says, how would I do this when using my kettlebell? I've been lifting it up in front of myself with two arms straight, should I bend my legs? So, 
I don't know how heavy the kettlebell is. <clears throat> is it something you should actually even be lifting? And I'm not going to go there because that's way outside the, the, the ability of this particular event. But if you're going to be, you know, if you're going to, if you want to hold it out here for whatever reasons, which physics, you're increasing the lever arm. So you're adding a lot of stress on the spine and the shoulder girdle. If that's your intention, that's okay. If that's not your intention, you might want to not do that, right? But if that's your intention, you, de you definitely want to be bending those knees and, and pushing through your feet. Concentrate on pushing through the feet. That's, that's key because now you're getting that ground reaction force gravity and, and, and it's assisting so that you're not asking those body parts to, to do something they're not meant to do alone. Thank you. And this question, and again, you you work with people virtually. I know people watching have, have done that. So maybe talk about yes. that because this next question from Catherine might be too specific to her. I mean, you can give general information because you have done talks about back pain here, but she says that she's 57 and she has spon spondylo Lysthesis, grade two. And lysthesis, yep. Thank you. Grade two in the lumbar area, degenerative disc disease, osteopenia in the low back, 155 pounds, 5'8. And she wants to know what's the best way to deal with back pain. Usually, exercise or movement is prescribed, but sometimes it makes the pain worse. I'm continuing to try physiotherapy, but it hasn't resolved it yet. Tried acupuncture briefly, didn't feel it changed anything. Tried osteopathy but it seems not to be doing anything and gave up after eight treatments. So what does Kath need? Yeah, so without going into a 20 minute lecture on the biomechanics of the lumbar spine and why spondylolisthesis actually happens, which I'm sure the rest of the audience really doesn't wanna know um, or care all that much about, th there's a reason that slippage happens. Spondylolisthesis is when, okay, if any bones down here, I'd show you. Um, Spondylolisthesis is when one level of the vertebrae, usually it's an anterior, um, it'll slip forward. It's, typically it's L4 on L5, sometimes it's L5 on S1, and there's different grades. There's grade one, two, three, and four. Um, if it's serious enough grade, they do surgery because it's, there's a high risk there. Um, even some kids have like a grade one spondylolisthesis, right? But it's because there's a mechanics in the body that's not performing properly. So there's always things that can be done Ideally, when, when people go to physical therapy, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but physical therapists are very different from one to another, um, depending on what training they've taken, what skills they've, they've acquired, what coursework they've attended. You'll have one PT who's extremely different from another PT where neither one of them will know anything about what the other one knows. So you're kind of, it's the luck of the draw when you go to see a PT. You, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's physical therapy. Like it's all the same. You know, it's like, no, it, it, it's woof. Can it be different? So, so that said, your therapist may have no understanding of three plane of applied functional science uh, knowledge. Um, he or she may not know anything about that. They might be a new grad and be relatively inexperienced, even though they are well schooled on anatomy and basic physiology, they still may not really know a lot and they're still learning, right? and they're learning on you, that happens in every profession. Um, so to, to, uh, to try to answer your question, I can't really advise you any specific movements because I could do more harm than good. It would be really irresponsible of me, but you do wanna be doing movements in three planes. You wanna be doing movements that are promoting proper function of the pelvis. And I would say making sure from the ground up things are correct. Because if they're not, that could be what caused that enterolisthesis to happen. If it's anterior, I'm assuming it is, the majority of them are. Um, hopefully that helps. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not looking to get busier because I'm pretty busy, but I do do consults if that would help you. So. Thank you. There's two more questions. Can we go through them rather quickly, if possible? Sure as quickly as you yes. can, thank you just because I have another show right away. Yes. And uh, Julie says she's 53 and had been experiencing mild discomfort in her right shoulder on and off for four years. And last month, her right arm locked itself to the right side of her body with excruciating pain. And the x-ray said it was a piece of calcium lodged between 
shoulder blades. And the diagnosis was calcific tendonitis with frozen shoulder. And he suggested surgery because the calcium piece will not be absorbed. Any input would be appreciated. Well, that's going to be hard to answer quickly. So what I will say is, <laughs> that's what I will possible. say is calcium, you know, it got deposited there for a reason. There was something going on in the mechanics of the shoulder that required the body to deposit calcium there for a reason. The body doesn't do things without a reason. So there's something going on with the biomechanics that is absolutely wrong. Frozen shoulders are horrific. I've experienced one myself. Um, I resolved mine in less than six months. They usually take a year to two years. Um, and that's because I was doing a lot of research. If I'd have known what I knew when I started, I probably would have gotten done in two or three months. But, but that said, um, yeah, there's a reason that calcium is there. As far as surgery being required, that I wouldn't be able to say yes or no to, um, you know, but, but seeking out somebody who's trained in applied functional science might be a good idea to get a second opinion. Thank you. And the last question is from Jackie. And she'd like to know what you think of trigger point injections for myofascial pain in the back shoulders and neck along with physical therapy. Well, I can answer this pretty quickly. Trigger point therapy is very, very effective. And a lot of people aren't aware of it, but President Kennedy had his, his private physician, Janet Travell, was known for kind of putting trigger point therapy on the map. And he almost didn't run for office because he had such severe back pain. Um, and they injected his trigger points with a specific medication that alleviated his pain and, and really helped him. So um, I, my thought is, if you know what's causing the trigger points. Because again, the muscles are responding to something. The muscles, it's kind of like a tug of war. If a muscle gets abnormally pulled, it pulls back and it'll create those little pockets of trigger points because it's just freezing up and it's locking up there, right? So you got to get the mechanics back in the body or all of those things are just a stopgap. They're just a simple symptomatic treatment. Great. Eileen, thank you so much. You've just got so much information. I really appreciate it. Well, I love the chance to be here, AJ, and hopefully so people are we've helping. done we've done shoulders, we've done back, I think we've done knees, and I think we've done hips. Maybe we've even done ankles. What body parts? I don't do think we, we did knees. Oh, well, then we have to do knee, maybe knees and ankles, because those are pe places people often have problems. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds good. All we'll right. That okay. sounds great. Thank you so much, Eileen. All right. Bye. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for the Lifestyle Docs, Dr. Chala and Dr. Chala. And they are going to be talking about substance use, addictions, and behavior change. Take care.